Good evening, everybody. In this video, we're going to learn about light. And when I say light, that includes all manner of electromagnetic waves. Well, what does that mean? Well, let's kind of learn a little bit. Uh, but first, let's kind of review a little bit of the history leading us up to this point. The first person who tried to explain what light was and how it behaved was Isaac Newton. It's actually something he published before he published his work on the laws of motion. Um, and Isaac Newton basically treated light like it was a particle, which he called a corpuscle. And so it was referred to as the corpuscle theory. It explained um, refraction and reflection well enough, but it did not explain, in 1800, Thomas Young's experiment, which was the double slit experiment, which was the diffraction interference of light. So in 1800, we had this paradigm shift, and we started thinking about light as a wave. Uh, a couple years after that, this character by the name of James Clerk Maxwell, in about 1865, predicted that from certain electrical circuits, you would get changing electric fields, which would produce a changing magnetic field, which produces a changing electric field, which would in turn um, keep on um, continuing that pattern, and would create a wave that would propagate outwards. And in his calculations, keyword here, calculate and predict, um, he saw that the um, waves would travel at a velocity that was the same as the measured velocity of the speed of light, which is 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. So he predicted this wave um, that would come from an electric circuit that had the same velocity as, as light. And so he thought, well, maybe they were similar or the same. And then a few years after that, in 1888, this character by the name of Heinrich Hertz, we named the unit for frequency after him, was able to build something that would create such waves, we might call it a radio, and he measured, keyword there, measured their velocity to be equal to that of the speed of light. And so starting from the idea that light was a particle, now we've kind of come full circle to the idea that light is a wave and it can be produced by changing electric fields. And so that's why light and other type waves are referred to as electromagnetic waves. We can say EM for short. Basically what's happening is that we have a changing or oscillating electric field, which creates a changing magnetic field, which again changes the electric field. And so we have this oscillation back and forth which moves through space. I'm going to attempt to kind of draw a picture here, because we need to do um, three dimensions here. So I'm going to say to the right is the x-axis, up is the y-axis, and out of the page is the z-axis. And so that might represent an electric field oscillating in space. It's kind of in the x-y plane. This picture would represent an oscillating magnetic field. If we kind of draw the um, vectors that would represent those fields, for the electric field, they would oscillate up and down. For the magnetic field, they would oscillate in and out of the page. So it's kind of got a thing three-dimensional here. The whole wave as a, a whole moves to the right in the x direction. And so you've got an electric field which oscillates up and down. That's the red. A magnetic field which oscillates in and out of the page. That's the blue. And then the wave energy moves to the right. That's the orange arrow. And so because the disturbance in both the electric and magnetic field is perpendicular to the direction that it moves, electromagnetic waves are transverse, which we're going to see has some important things. And then in a vacuum, this propagation would move um, in the x direction at a velocity of 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, which we give that special symbol C. So here's kind of a better picture of that. We've got the varying electric field, so kind of outlining that. And then a varying magnetic field, so kind of outlining that in and out of the page. And then the whole thing moves in the x direction, which would be like this way. And so all three of those lines are perpendicular to each other. And so that's what an electromagnetic wave looks like. So we have this thing called the electromagnetic spectrum. 
And the reason that we have it is because different frequencies, keyword frequency, of electromagnetic waves will behave in different ways. So keyword here, we group them by frequency. Now that doesn't really have anything to do with the different frequencies. It really has to do more with the structure of matter and how it's made up. And so radio waves behave differently than visible light, not because the waves are different, but because of matter. Um, the size of atoms, the spacing in molecules, things like that determine how waves interact with um, stuff, matter. So, to kind of break down the electromagnetic waves, going from low frequency to high frequency. Lowest frequency waves are called radio. The next highest frequency waves are referred to as microwaves. So they're a little bit higher in frequency than a radio. Your cell phone would be an example of something that works on microwaves. Your microwave oven would be another example. Then a region of frequencies that are referred to as infrared or infrared light. And then a narrow band that we can actually see, we refer to as visible light. Beyond that would be something called ultraviolet light, which if you're a bee, you may look through things and see ultraviolet light. And then higher than that is x-rays. And then the last and highest frequency electromagnetic waves are gamma waves, which you probably never experienced unless you've been to a nuclear power plant or you've eaten a lot of bananas. To break down the visible spectrum, it will look something like that, where the lowest frequency of visible light would be red, and then the highest frequency of visible light would be violet light. No such thing as purple light, we should say violet to be correct. So notice that right next to red light in the sequence is the infrared light, and that right next to violet in the sequence is ultraviolet light. So that'll kind of help you remember the um, order. If you took some elementary school classes, you were probably taught an acronym like Roy G. Biv to remember the order of a rainbow. That's the order of the frequencies of visible light. To kind of give you some ranges, red light is approximately 750 nanometers. Violet light is approximately 400 nanometers. So you can see it's a very, very narrow range of um, wavelengths that you can actually see. Most of these electromagnetic waves do not interact with your eye so that you can't really see them. So here's probably a better picture than what I can draw. And it kind of gives you a little bit of the idea of the scale. When it says about the size of down here, that's saying that the wavelength is about the size of those things. So buildings are the size of radio waves, whereas a molecule will be the size of an ultraviolet ray. So that just kind of gives you a little bit of idea of the scale. Here's kind of another picture where the visible light is kind of broken down um, into its spectrum from left to right so that you can kind of get an idea of that. One cool feature about um, electromagnetic waves that's kind of important is the idea that they can be polarized. Polarized waves, and this can only happen for transverse waves, means that the fields are oscillating in the same plane. So a picture of polarized light, if we have one light wave whose electric field looks like this, and then we have a second light wave whose electric field looks like that, we would say they are polarized. I'm kind of neglecting the um, magnetic field just for simplicity's sake. However, if we had a picture that looked like this versus a picture that looked like that, then those two ways would not be polarized. And so polarization will tell us a lot about how light, or EM waves in general, interact with matter. We can use polarization to tell what stuff is made out of, for example. Um, for us, it's real important to understand how we can filter light based on its polarity. A polarizing filter is a material, um, which is usually crystalline or something like that, that only allows light to pass through if its electric field oscillates in a particular plane. So a picture might look something like this. We have randomly polarized light on the left. 
we pass it through this piece of material called a polarizer, then only light which is um, polarized in the plane of the polarizer will actually travel through. So a good analogy is to think about it as being a picket fence for light. So let's kind of draw a little bit more of a better picture for that. So here's some light coming out of the screen. So imagine a beam of light coming towards you. It would typically be randomly polarized, meaning the electric fields would be oscillating in all different directions for each individual wave. So it might look something like that. The polarizing filter, if you look at it from the edge, will look something more like this. It's basically be like a picket fence. What that means is that only the light waves which are polarized so that their electric field oscillates up and down will actually make it through. The rest of the light will be absorbed. So there's a couple of different uses for this phenomenon. Um, one, which you may be familiar with, is used for blocking out unwanted light based on its polarity. Um, there's lots of filters that rely on polarization for their operation. So for example, these are two pictures of basically the same scene. The one taken on the left was taken with a normal camera lens. The one on the right was taken with a polarizing filter. You can buy, and this is not as common anymore, uh, but you can buy polarizing filters for computer monitors, which will cut down a lot on the glare. Glare would be unwanted light. And you can buy sunglasses that will reduce the amount of light that gets through them based on polarization. It helps reduce the glare. If you wear polarizing sunglasses and you go out on a lake, for example, you can actually see down into the water and you can see things like fish swimming around and stuff like that. Um, if you're like me, you just got to remember to take them off when you pump gas because those gas pump um, card readers, those little screens, usually have polarizing filters on them as well. And if you don't get them lined up correctly, you can't see things through them. So that's the end of our video on light. Pretty short and sweet. Big ideas. Backing up for just a second. We kind of need to understand how an electromagnetic wave looks be able to draw a picture, indicate which direction it's moving from a picture like that. We need to know the order of the uh, electromagnetic waves in terms of frequency, and so knowing that infrared waves are lower frequency than light waves is kind of important to us. And then we need to be able to describe and explain how polarization works and how a polarizing filter works. So those are the kind of the big ideas we need to take away from this. Uh, we'll discuss and answer any questions we have next time in class. Till then, ta-ta.